It's really great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Esther Herzog, who is a professor of social anthropology at Zefat Academic College in Israel. Um, she has spent the past 30 years researching, teaching, and also being an activist on, on feminism and social struggles. Her work focuses on bureaucracy and gender with a with the context of immigration, politics, welfare, education, development projects, and the Holocaust. She, a visit to the web, her website uh, will show you the extent of her work and publication, so I will not go into that. But she has, she's the author of numerous books and articles. And um, this, her talk today is based on one of her books, which has come out recently which is called uh, State Violence Towards Mothers and Children. The topic of her talk, the title of her talk is Threatened Motherhood in the Israeli Welfare State, the discourse and the practice behind the disqualification of disadvantaged women's motherhood. Another of her good books, very good books, like all her other books, is a, 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 the author of Immigrants and Bureaucrats, Ethiopians in an Israeli Absorption Center. And she's a co-editor of Israel, Local Anthropology, and many, many more. So um, Esther, I'm going to stop here and ask you to, to, to give us the benefits of your talk. Right, Esther, over to you. Thank you. OK. Thank you so much, Sumaya. I'm very, very grateful. So thank you for inviting me to give a talk on this distinguished platform of the Women's Rights in the Middle East Seminars. And I'm honored to be hosted by the Middle East Center in Oxford. And my thanks go also to Ms. Stacy Churcher for her valuable assistance in organizing this event and for the wonderful poster. My academic home at Sefat Academic College enabled the, the book's publication, the one that, I'm, uh, that my talk is based on, and I'm grateful for that. So in my talk, I shall elaborate on the role of state authorities, especially the welfare system and the courts in undermining disadvantaged women's motherhood. I shall also describe a few cases as time will allow, illustrating the devastating outcomes of this confrontation for both mothers and children and the hopeless struggle of mothers to prevent the disqualification of their motherhood. My study emerges from 30 years of involvement in single mother struggles against the expropriation of their custody over their offspring. Many insights were also gained from critical reading of feminist studies on motherhood and poverty. I came to realize that although motherhood is widely cherished, its value in practice is connected to state policies and various interests. Hence, I shall examine the gap between the highly esteemed value bestowed on motherhood, <clears throat> sorry, vis-a-vis -vis its worth in reality. My, my participation in mother struggles against the expropriation of their motherhood started in the beginning of the 90s. It happened when I met Karen, a young newcomer from South Africa. Karen was referred to me by a journalist who wrote about the problematic attitude of the social workers toward her complaint about her divorcee's suspected sexual conduct toward the two years old daughter. After our meeting, I became profoundly involved in Karen's case for a long time. Karen told me that the social workers blamed her and her daughter for imagining things and suggested that she should have psychiatric tests. Soon after the article was published, the social workers claimed that Karen is an unfitting mother and an abusive mother. They recommended to the court to provide protection for the child who is allegedly needy and at risk. The youth investigators evaluation determined that the child could have been sexually molested and the, psych the psychiatrist suggested that the father is capable of losing the sense of what is forbidden. Nevertheless, the judge's verdict was to remove the girl from her mother's custody to the father's custody. 
based on the social workers' recommendations <clears throat> that the mother suffers from the symbiosis syndrome, the judge ruled that the mother harms the girl, perceiving her as part of her entity. Quoting the psychiatrist's opinion, he, con he concluded that Karen is unaware of her difficulties, whereas the father and his spouse <clears throat> are aware, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and therefore they are capable of dealing with them. Our efforts to get, to get help from senior officers in the welfare ministry, from children's rights organizations, <clears throat> from parliament members and even from the town's mayor failed. The little girl was removed to her father's home. Later on, when my involvement with many other cases expanded, I came to realize that Karen's and her daughter's affair represented a broad reality beyond that specific case. The social workers and the judge's attitude was found to be part of a general pattern declining to examine thoroughly unjust and evil decisions and practices, unable or unwilling to take steps to do justice with mothers and children, adhering to state authorities' expectations and to power centers' interests. I learned that Karen's case is not exceptional, but it rather represents a bureaucratically structured phenomenon. It entails consistent behavioral patterns of officials who are committed to their employing organization from which they obtain their living and gain social and professional benefits. State authorities undermine mother's custodial rights over the children, especially through the discourse about child's, child's well-being and parental incompetence, blaming mothers for physically endangering and neglecting their children. While the formal discourse emphasizes the value of biological motherhood, in practice, underprivileged mother's custody over their offspring can be easily undermined. Single parent mothers are a susceptible group from which babies can be taken away to adopt, adoption and the children can be taken away to foster families or to welfare institutions. Although motherhood is repeatedly praised in court hearings and in general public discourse, yet in practice it is often placed below the well being and lives of women's children. It follows that considering the good of the child as su superseding the good of the mother inadvertently implies perceiving the mother as an object and a function for the other, in Palgi Hecker's words. However, quite often, when the social and legal authorities intervene in their lives, neither the mothers nor the child's rights seem to prevail. The mother-child conflict in the Israeli welfare state is widely revealed in practices of adoption and out-of-home placement of children and youth. Involving the expropriation of parenthood when uh, when um, the exponent of, of parenthood is involved. According to Shimoni and Ben Benishti, single parent mothers are, most, are the most susceptible population with regard to out of home placement of babies and children who are being taken away to adoption, to foster families or to welfare institutions. This welfare policy is justified by claims about physical abuse and dangerous neglect of minors. I suggest that the expropriation of disadvantaged single mother's parenthood serves veiled interests, economic, organizational, and professional. Thus, I argue that women's fertility is exploited by powerful groups to gain custody over their offspring. The expropriation of custody over babies and children from disadvantaged mothers is also perceived as means of silencing mother's claims conveying a threatening message to other women who demand economic assistance from the state. Some feminist studies stress the connection between globalization, neoliberal policies, and women's poverty, in particular of those heading single parent family, families. However, these studies ignore the connection between women's weakness and the hidden threat of losing custody over their children. My research, 
and social activity unveil this hardly spoken phenomenon. Stigmatizing and disqualifying disempowered women's motherhood occurs by blaming these women as failing mothers and by blurring society's responsibility for their and their children's situation. Andrea O'Reilly and Mary Porter argue in a similar vein that blaming the stig and stigmatizing women as bad mothers is a familiar response to many social problems. In the last dec decades, there is a growing feminist research relating to the profound role of motherhood in the feminine identity. Afro-American scholars criticize the white feminists for ignoring the immense importance of motherhood for women. According to O'Reilly and Porter, this weak spot in the feminist attitude to motherhood emerges from perceiving motherhood as a major source of women's oppression and as causing their vulnerability and limitation. In Israel too, there is a growing tendency to connect motherhood and the feminine identity. Several studies focus on poor mother's hardships. However, almost none deal with the potential threat over these women's motherhood. The caring for the child discourse on the one hand and the bad mother discourse on the other ensure the widely accepted public legitimacy for taking away children for, from their families. The gap between the rhetoric about the right of motherhood and the practices that, under, that undermine it can be explained as serving the interest of the welfare institutions lobby, which depends on the out of home placement welfare policy. A few verdicts issued by several prominent judges will serve, can serve to illustrate how decisions of expropriating women's motherhood are based on rhetoric about biological motherhood versus children's welfare. So Judge Pinchas Schiffman, for instance, admitted that the verdict he examined raised the concern that taking away babies for adoption is a problematic practice. He implied that there is an inconsistency between the rhetoric opposing adoption of disadvantaged parents' offspring by better off couples and actual decisions in specific cases. He wrote in his book as follows. It appears to me that all agree that the adoption law is not a tool for redistribu redistribution of children's population in the country. We are not ready the children will be taken away from the parents' custody just because their economic or spiritual situation is unfavorable. Similar statements were expressed in other various verdicts by high court judges. In one case, Judge Joshua Pilpel from a regional court rejected the social worker's recommendation to transfer a girl to an adopting family based on psychologist's observation that the mother is, and I quote, retarded and primitive. In his verdict, he wrote, the adoption law was not designed to enable a re redistribution of children and their transfer from one family to another family just because in the new family, the parents' level is much higher or because in another family, conditions of bringing up children and the atmosphere are better than in the biological family. Thus, Judge Pilpel's statement criticizes the redistribution of babies according to parents' socioeconomic status. It seems, therefore, that the judge's reproach of the social workers emphasizing that the state cannot be an agency that transfers babies from poor parents to better off parents demonstrates his understanding that this is what the authorities do in practice. A similar judicial criticism of the social workers was expressed by the former High Court Judge Ayala Pocaccia. Pocaccia expressed her reservations with regard to the prolonged legal discussions in the bay, what was called Baby of Strife case. She criticized sharply the welfare authority, <clears throat> authorities for the deep, and I quote, blow to the natural justice principle for no fault of the mother end of quote, and for abusing the parents' weakness, giving up the child in, I quote, a passing crisis. 
Procaccia blamed the social workers' passion to get in haste parents' acceptance to the adoption, capturing parents in providing acceptance to their uh, uh, adoption, abusing mother's weakness to get control over the, the children seems to be embedded in the social power order and a part of social political bargains. This veiled implication behind the expropriation of women's custody over the babies and children gained only negligible attention in the feminist research. Grumer Nevo, for instance, should suggest that the social workers act as a whip against single parent mothers and that they do not feel empathy to the mother's situation. Yet, she ignores the connection between women's poverty and the disqualification of their motherhood. It is argued then that the legal and welfare practice, uh, practices enable the expropriation of disadvantaged women's motherhood, using their children as a resource for social transaction. This argument will be illustrated by the drug rehabilitation syndrome that refers to pregnant and birthing drug addicted women. Halper and Kadari's work on mother fetus relationships and the use of drugs by pregnant women described the legal, legal development that created the independent status of the minor, an unborn baby in this case, apart from the mother's status and rights. In fact, the separate status of the unborn baby from that of the mother enables those in authority to abolish the mother's right, rights with regard to the fetus, justifying this by claiming that the mother may harm the baby. This position serves the welfare authorities in, uh, and I'm quote, it's a quote, a quote, stimulating what was called pregnancy police, which will intervene in any decision that the woman makes during her pregnancy, claiming that it can influence negatively the fetus. Halper and Kadari argues that the draconian step, that's, that's how she puts it, draconian steps, she says, are employed against pregnant women who are in a medically and needful position. Society found here, she writes, the chance to impose supervision through the feminine birthing functions, which are anyway very susceptible to its control. Nevertheless, I suggest that it is the opportunity to, to take away unborn babies from women in a vulnerable situation that is behind the pregnancy police rather than intentional practices, practice of undermining women's birth rights or of punishing drug addicted women. Hence, it is not surprising that about 50% of the babies that are born with the drug rehabilitation syndrome were taken away to adoption. I suggest that taking away babies from adoption takes place from underprivileged mothers and not only from mothers who are sus suspected of harming the fetus. This policy stimulates the widely accepted belief that those mothers' babies should be taken away for the baby's sake. It appears, therefore, that the state intervention in individuals' and families' lives and the use of coercive, coercive means are directed toward marked groups whose so-called social deviance or absence of parental competence are widely accepted. Hidden pressures that lobbyists and better off childless people exert on politicians seem to, to lie behind the rhetoric, the legislation and the coercive means. The discourse that perceives the good of the child as standing above biological motherhood has been revealed in various struggles relating to adoption brought to the Israeli courts. This advantaged mothers vulnerability, which makes it easier to take away the babies, was exposed in several cases that became known as the baby strife. There were three cases, famous cases, one in 2004, the other in 2013, and the other one in 2017. Those cases can demonstrate how the adoption practices undermine the biological role of motherhood, especially that of disadvantaged mothers. 
In several cases, birth mothers who suffered from a, a postpartum depression gave up their babies for adoption, but regretted the decision a short time later. The most famous affair took place in 2004 and 2005. I was exposed to the affair following a meeting with the birth mother and her spouse while her appeal was discussed at the high court. In that case, the mother con confirmed her consent to giving up the baby because of economic and emotional difficulties. She regretted her decision after a short time. According to the law at, at, at that time, a birth mother could relinquish her consent to give away her baby within three months and her baby would be returned to her. After a long legal struggle in the courts, the high court's verdict determined that the baby should be left with the adoptive, adoptive parents. According to the social workers' recommendations, the verdict was saturated with rhetoric about the value of the family, the voice of blood, and the voice of nature side by side with claims about the good of the child. Although the latter concept is vague and ambiguous as revealed by some scholars, the judges decided still to prefer the adoptive parents. Schuss, a law scholar, argued that this verdict illustrates how, I quote, judges are influenced by their worldviews and tend to ascribe heavy weight to experts' opinions. Ben David, another a scholar from social work, uh, um, also pointed to the problematic use of definitions of par parent parenthood com competence and the good of the child in forced adoption processes. The legal discourse, she argued, brings in the voice of the professional expert, whereas the biological parent's voice is not heard. The verdict in the above mentioned case demonstrate the fact that biological motherhood of underprivileged mothers is su subject to powerful social bargaining and is controlled by state authorities. Uh, state authorities. In this reality, it is possible to carry out unofficially interclass trade in babies. Judge Ayala Prokacha implied this understanding, calling, the, uh, calling to cancel the adoption. She exposed the bias behind the hearings caused, for instance, by the prolonged trial, which benefited the adopting couple who had kept the baby with them through that time. Contrary to Prokacha, Judge Aaron Barak, the president of the high court at the time, and the other five judges decided not to cancel the adoption process. The explanations belittled the mother's emotional distress after giving birth and ignored the fact that she was psychologically pressured by social workers to sign her consent to offering her baby for adoption. They also ignored the recommendations of the mother's advocate, the baby's guardian, and the psychologist, none of which fitted their position. The judges adopted the hypothetical ass assessment of endangering the minor if it were to be returned to his biological mother, disqualifying the supremacy of biological motherhood. Barak used the term optimal parental competence to justify the high court's decision. Thus, the discourse on the good of the child served to whitewash the cruel implications for the biological mother and for biological motherhood at large. It appears, therefore, the judge's verdicts expose a striking contradiction between the rhetoric and the actual decisions in specific cases. The formal rhetoric criticizing decisively taking away children of poor, disadvantaged parents for adoption, perceiving it as an act of this redistribution connected to the class structure. Judges and social workers who come from relati relatively better off groups seem to prefer those who are closer to their social status. Relying conveniently on social workers' recommendations, the judges transfer babies of mothers in stressful situation to better off parents, endorsing the supremacy of optimal parenthood over biological attachment. 
It is argued, therefore, that the courts and the welfare system serve the interest of better off groups, facilitating the exploitation of the birthing capability of disadvantaged women as a resource for fulfill, fulfilling the demand for babies of more affluent women. I shall describe now one case in which I was profoundly involved, accompanying a mother who struggles to prevent the welfare authorities and the courts from taking away her 11 years old son. This case illustrates the unbearable outcomes for disadvantaged single parent mothers in confronting powerful state agencies. The professional discourse plays a prominent role in such cases. The conspicuous terms used in this discourse are, again, parental incompetence and the good of the child. Both are perceived by the social and legal authorities as potentially incongruent. Some 24 years ago, Idan was taken away from Batya, an impoverished blind single parent, and he was transferred over a period of one year and a half to state controlled institutions. I, I was exposed to this case when Batya called me up following a radio interview in which I talked about the disturbing conditions in welfare institutions for youth at risk. My involvement in this affair included daily telephone conversations with Batya, visits at her home, participating in court hearings, and taking with, talking with journalists, Knesset members, lawyers, police officers, professionals in children's rights organizations and others. I witnessed Batya's and Idan's intolerable experiences caused by various local and state officials and in court hearings. This affair started, started following Batya's de uh, demand that her son be removed to another class because of a clash between her and his class teacher. Her request was dismissed by the school director and the heads of the local educational department. Idan stayed at home for a whole year, while Batya tried to find another school for her son. As these efforts were blocked by the head of the educational department, Batya carried on her fight by turning to the local and national media, to the state controller, to Organization for Children's Welfare and Human Rights, to Knesset members, and to officials in the Ministry of Education. These actions were angrily responded by the local departments of education and welfare. Batya was warned that her son would be taken away from her if she did not stop her public accusations. As Batya continued her confrontation with the authorities, the social workers in the, in the local welfare department recommended expropriating her custody of Idan. The main claim was that she was suffocating her son, depending on him and disturbing his development. The courts accepted the social workers' recommendation as they do in most similar cases. They ordered to abolish her custody and to remove it done against his and his mother's will to an emergency shelter. Idan stayed there for 11 months. He ran away a few times and was caught by the policeman who returned him to the shelter. Then Idan was transferred to a welfare hostel in Jerusalem, far from his mother's home. He stayed there for another seven months. Following my suggestion to serve as a foster family for Idan, which was approved by the court, Idan was transferred to my home. He told us about his tough experiences in the shelter and in the hostel and about the coercive means used to control and to punish the inmates, among which were cold showers and enforced isolation. Batya complained a few times about the workers' violent behavior and was repeatedly told by police of officials and ev that everything was okay. When Idan was 16, Batya died away of breast cancer. He left, uh, he left us, Idan left us, and returned to his mother's home. Idan has never succeeded to recuperate, and he was repeatedly involved in illegal activities, dealing with the police and the courts. From a gifted child, he became a homeless person and often involved in criminal circles. This example demonstrates the op oppressive power that state authorities hold and employ, especially when it comes to individuals who lack socioeconomic resources. 
My understanding is therefore, as stated earlier, that disadvantaged women like Batya can be conveniently stigmatized by the welfare and legal state systems as unfit mothers. This case also reveals how the welfare and the educational department serve as, a lo as the long arm of the local municipality, silencing and punishing poor mothers who are troublemakers by expropriating the custody of the children. Expropriating custody over children serves to convey a warning of threat to single parent mothers against disturbing the authorities by, for instance, demanding housing or subsistence assistance and becoming a burden on the state treasure. In Batya, Batya's and Idan's case, the public attention gained by, by media coverage of the struggle irritated the officials and incited their desire to teach Batya a lesson. Taking away her, an, her only child could signal to other mothers in a similar situation to be careful when turning to the authorities. Thus, mothers can be controlled by threatening their motherhood. In general, judges appear to assume in good faith or under constraint that the social workers are driven by sincere concern of children's well-being and are carrying out invaluable work. Although abuse of children seem to occur often in welfare institutions, judges seem to believe that they are better than a home in which the mother is allegedly unable to protect her child. Jud judges routinely rely on, on, on diagnosing agencies that cooperate with the welfare authorities. Thus, both the good of the child and the right of motherhood are not guaranteed in the welfare state. It seems that the child well-being and the child-mother bonding can be jeopardized by state authorities, especially when it comes to disadvantaged mothers. So to conclude, elaborating on the mother-child conflict revealed that the social value attached to the concept of the good of the child serves as a smoke screen in Bowles and Ginty's words to conceal the instrumental use of motherhood for realizing social political interests. Discussing the context of the Israeli welfare policy at present concerning babies and children at risk may highlight the fragile status of motherhood as influenced by women's socioeconomic situation. Disadvantaged mother's custody can be easily terminated by using a term terminology of caring for minors' well being, perceiving it as preceding their mother's right to motherhood. I try to unveil the destructive outcomes of the unrestricted power of state agencies and other powerful organizations over both children and mothers. Hence, I conclude that underprivileged women's biological and sociological natures are exploited by more affluent people, the state and various agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, just really fascinating paper. Uh, I, I really appreciate hearing about this because um, we know that Israel is a pronatalist country. In fact, when it comes to infertility treatment, Israel has got the highest rate number of free IVF cycles in the world. So when you think, you know, in a country like that, everything has to be encouraged towards motherhood. And from right. everything you are telling us is the discrimination which exists there. Um, I imagine we can discuss it later about, um, is it a particular social group of women who are being actually um, are targeted? vulnerable group, you know, you are saying women are exploited, you know, women's fertility is exploited. You would have thought they want to encourage people to have more children. And this is surely a disincentive for people to go on reproducing. Um, so um, I have many, many comments and questions, but I just, I wanted to thank you very much. I'm sorry that I can't see all the participants. Thank you for coming. And I very much hope that at some point we can open and be in person and meet everybody, which is completely different dynamics. But thank you so much, Esther. I really, really learned and enjoy, learned from and enjoy your paper. And when I see you next, I will ask you many more questions on that. Okay. Thank you so thank, much. And thank you, Soraya, very much. And thanks, uh, Stacy, for our wonderful work. And it was really 
a pleasure. Thank you.